Hi there, I'm Helen Skelton. And I'm Rio Ferdinand. And we are here at Wembley Stadium, the home of football, to celebrate the most famous knockout competition of them all. That's right, the FA Cup is respected across the world. For the players, believe me, this place is special. Jam-packed with drama, glory and passion. Yeah, for the fans as well, whether you're watching in the stands and you're freezing cold, or whether you're sitting at home watching on the telly, there's something magical about a big giant killing or a plucky cup run. If you want to see the very best that this historic competition has produced, look no further. We're about to enjoy the top 50 greatest moments that the FA Cup has ever produced. The FA Cup final day itself is amazing. Unbelievable stuff! I've got to be honest, I think they got the colour wrong. I do, I think they got the colour wrong. So we don't rain, eh? We will be in trouble. Oh my God, we're going to beat Arsenal! In the winter I used to wear a vest, yeah. Who's got the biggest CV? You have. All right, we're going round yours. Couldn't be saying this, but I was actually in the pub. I was in the Bull's Head in Swinton. Play with, he was great. Play against, he was murder. I'm now a way to get me suit measured. Yes! He was the porn star of football, wasn't he? Got up on the Monday morning, severe hangover. The physique was there for all to see. I mean, a lot of the girls would have been whooping, I should think. I was just like, whoa! <laughs> you can pull off those short shorts, you can pull off that hair. FA Cups make superstars of players. The magic of the cup and what comes with that, it's, it's a really important part of football. I'm so proud to say I've won the cup. There's nothing like it. We're going to show you 50 of the greatest moments from the most magical competition in domestic football, the FA Cup. All picked by a panel of BBC football experts. Wembley is awe-inspiring, but for players, you must get a bit nervous. Yeah, you do at times, but you put a bit of old-school rap on, and off you go. <laughs> is that what's going on through the massive headphones, always rap? I heard you down as more of a little mix, Taylor Swift. No, 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 you can't go wrong with a little bit of old-school rap. I think you can. <laughs> Liverpool FC is hot as hell, United Tottenham Arsenal. Watch my lips, and they will spell. They don't just play, they can rap as well. Liverpool FC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so bad. Oh, dearie me. I think the last time I heard that was about two or three years ago at school. It's genius. It's, it's a great, it's a great thing. Well, I'm rapping now, I'm rapping for fun. I'm your goalie, the number one. You can take the mix, don't call me a glam. Anymore, look, when you're going down. Bruce Grobelard here turned up, probably a few quid in it for him to do the spaghetti legs. It's the worst kind of dad dancing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want new trouble and you don't want to slap, you better teach us the Anfield rap. The Anfield rap to me looks like if I'd have said to my dad in the 80s, Dad, you know, what's public enemy? I need to come walking out the bathroom you know, with a shell suit on, a cap backwards and going like that. All I wanted when I was a kid was a shell suit and I never got one because apparently they were too dangerous if you caught on fire. <laughs> I mean, I could fit in in the video, couldn't I? With my little cyclist hat. I just remember Johnny Barnes doing his bit, innit? That's the iconic bit for me. You two scouts are always yapping. I'm gonna show you some serious rapping. I come from Jamaica, my name is John Barnes. When I do my thing, the crowd go bananas. Why John Barnes? John Barnes, yeah. I think he's a Spanish player, he's a player for Spain. Don't forget everybody, he comes from Jamaica, his name is John Barnes, not technically right, but it scans. Uh, when he does his thing, the crowd go bananas. Well, when you've got someone that can sing like John Barnes, then why wouldn't you be doing a, a, a rap or a song every season? Everybody wanted to be a rapper, and I don't know where it came from. Well, it was only John Barnes that could really rap. It's all right for John Barnes, he can pull it up. Liverpool FC, he's committed to it, he's got some juice to his voice. Curtis to the lads to have the bravery to even, you know, go and do it. He comes from there, and he comes from there. He once went to the Lake District. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Johnson's um, is, um, I think he's down under. It's a bit odd as well, isn't it? I'm very big down under from the West. I mean, it's borderline culturally insensitive. That's what I'm going to call it. I don't know if it was their own gear or, well, I guess back in the day, that's genuinely how they dress. And we know that footballers like to be flamboyant. I don't think we can condemn the Anfield rap mob for crimes that were happening across culture. I haven't got the best voice, you see, so I always turn things down like that. They couldn't have broke the top 40, surely. It did! Wow. Oh, yeah! I've often thought, you know, at times it must be hard being an Arsenal fan. I've been having my mates taking the Michael for the whole year. 
Do you know what I mean? For the year before that, the question is, when's the last trophy, though? When's the last trophy? When's the last trophy? They are superstar footballers who haven't won a trophy for a ludicrous amount of time. So for Arsenal, it was like uh, becoming a joke. Yeah, because the pressure was building, because they hadn't won a trophy for a long time. For Arsene Wenger and his team, this was really a moment they had to grab. They had to win it. There was no option. To be fair, Hull gave them the fright of their life. You just got that feeling like, oh, I can't believe we're throwing this away. After 2 0, it's very difficult when you still have got 70 minutes and you have got an animal like Arsenal hunting you down. Oh my god, we're going to beat Arsenal, we're going to beat Arsenal. No, you're not. What's going to happen is this is going to fall apart, it's going to unravel. Once we got one bite, I felt a lot more comfortable. I just remember the, the weird feeling thinking, no, just don't let this happen today, because that could have been the end of Arsene Wenger. In it goes, headed on, and a chance, and Arsenal has scored! Hull fought hard, but for once, Arsenal fought harder, and they went on and did it. Jules sticks on the ball, Ramsey! And Ramsey scores! Only oh, fair play to Ramsey, though, because, I, you know, he had an awful tackle a couple of years ago and you know he's come back and I think he's a terrific player. FA Cup was a vital trophy for Arsene, mainly. Not for Arsenal, for Arsene. That goal by Aaron Ramsey just may have kept him at Arsenal for the next 10 years. So for Wenger the pressure was finally off and it's allowed him to stay at the club for the next few years so in hindsight it was probably a terrible day in the club's history. To see Arsene Wenger being thrown up in the air <laughs> by his players was quite odd. I can't have been the only person watching that thinking that they're going to kill him. You know, Arsene Wenger, what's the one on the Muppets? He looks like him. Do you know the one on the Muppets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks dead like him. Is it like the bird one? The like purple crow or whatever he's called? It was like a sigh of relief because it was like, here we go, boys, we've got something again. It's a great thing to see as a fan, you know, it's nice to see that side and, and, and just how much it means to them. It's such a, like, a relief to finally have a trophy in our cabinet after nine years. Vital for the club, especially for the fans. I, th I think that they, hopefully they can uh, use that as an advantage to be uh, to be successful uh, in, in the years to come. It's probably one of the best comebacks, yes, because uh, most of the people thought they were all, again Arsenal. They're gonna underachieve. Nineteen sixty-six wasn't all about England winning the World Cup at Wembley. In the FA Cup final, Everton came back from 2-0 down to beat Sheffield Wednesday 3-2. But it was a couple of overzealous fans that stole the show. And two Everton supporters have raced onto the pitch and it's swamping for Milko. And their two supporters are going to see no more of this game. The guy runs on, normally it's some aggressive looking yob. And this guy's like, what, a 65-year-old accountant? He slips off his jacket. That perfect moment for the first copper to grab it and just slides away. Perfect. Basic police 101 is how to catch a drunk person. Don't end up looking like, like, like an idiot. And a great tackle. Almost on the line as that Everton supporter slips his toe. The second copper, true British style thinking, I could tackle him, but I've got my helmet on. That's not fair play. That's not cricket. Off comes the helmet, dives, the perfect rugby tackle, floors him, down he goes. He's celebrating on the floor like a true hero. And then, of course, the Everton players came along and did what Scousers do best. Calm down, calm down, calm down. And the phone probably telling the man to go quietly. The frog marching him off, and he's going, all right, OK, that was a laugh, wasn't it? Can I, can I carry on watching? No, you, you're coming with us. Yaya, Yaya Toure. 2011, Yaya Toure is Manchester City's main man. They're desperate for success. They've spent so much money on, on these talented players that they've got. They need to stand up and be counted. They need to step up to the mark. They could win their first trophy in 35 years. So really, you know, a monumental final this was for them. Silva. Balotelli. Silva again. Balotelli. Pinball. Against Stoke, 
was important because it was the end of the game. If I really get it and shoot it and bounce to the defender is coming in the middle, I decided and I shot to my with my life food and it was great. It pains me to see him in a city shirt, but he's just a quality player. I mean Yaya tucked it away. Incredible player. I think we all agree that 280,000 a week isn't good enough. And two birthday cakes, that ain't enough. The guy's got legitimate complaints. Got to be wishing Yaya happy birthday. If anybody at City, you wish Yaya, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I always smile. <laughs> Glory for Manchester City! The wait is over! You always need one trophy. Every manager says it. You need one trophy to start everything going. And that was City's. For all those naysayers who say, does the FA Cup really matter? Have a look at that bunch of gazillionaires celebrating that trophy because it did matter. Yaya Torre, I think we should pay him some more. So in 1938, Preston played Huddersfield in the first ever properly televised FA Cup final on the BBC. Not only was television new, commentators were new in 1938, certainly on television. And Tommy Woodruff was doing the radio commentary and he said, if Huddersfield don't win the cup, I will eat my hat. Another goal kick for Huddersfield. And I'll eat my head if there's any score before this whistle goes. How long is it? Just a minute. The commentators were so civilised back then. If he scores a goal now, I'll eat my hat. That would never happen now. If Motson had said, if they score now, I will eat my famous sheepskin coat, he'd probably still be eating it now, wouldn't he? You know, very dry a sheepskin coat. <laughs> if something happens now, I will eat my sheepskin coat. Motty, are you OK? <laughs> Another girl kid for Huddersfield. And I'll eat my head if there's any score before this whistle goes. How long is it? Just a minute. And of course, Preston won the game, and, and you can imagine what happened next. One of the comedy programmes had him with his hat chopped up and a bit of cheese, and they, they hammed it up so he was seen to eat his hat, you know. But that really, that final, was the start of the FA Cup final being televised. Wayne... That's why I must hate it when anyone scores an own goal these days, because he knows immediately. Oh, here we go. Every time there's an own goal, we used to compare it against one scored by a certain Wayne Hatswell. Now, he won't thank me for this. In fact, he wrote to us at one stage. I think he wrote to me and said, listen, I think enough's enough about mentioning this goal. So uh, please forgive me, uh, Wayne. Um, but... You know, it was a brilliant own goal. And the camera was obviously really good because he's thinking, oh, he's just going to clear this. And he was sort of preparing to sort of move the camera to show that it's been cleared. And next thing, this thing zooms into the back of the net. Certainly in FA Cup history, it has to go down as, um, as, as the best for me. Remember the name, Wayne Hatswell. If it had fist pumped, it would have made it brilliant, wouldn't it? Some of that. Wrong end, Wayne. Oof. Do you know, I love the idea of being a scout. Surely you mean girl guides? Ah, uh, ha, ha, very good. Uh, no, I mean a scout that gets to go all over the world watching big matches, big clubs. It seems really glamorous. I bet they get first class travel, everything. Listen, it's not always like that, you know. What do you mean? Well, sometimes you're just desperate to get 11 decent players out on the pitch. Some clubs will do absolutely anything to find a player. Take a look at this. Seafacts, a name manufactured from seeing facts. What's not to love about Seafacts? Every day, in from school, 302. Dad, give me that, 302, get it on there. My dad, actually, used to always look on there for a cheap holiday. That's how I remember CFAX. You could find out roadworks, you could do a little quiz. But Laurie Sanchez put an advert on CFAX. Yeah. Said, do you play football? Are you cup-tied? Can you come and play for me? And um, Alan Hutchins said, why don't we put it out on CFAX? That we're looking for a centre forward that isn't cup-tied, can play at this level, and it's only a short-term one-off game. CFAX it was. You were signed off CFAX, can you believe it? Um, yeah, I can't. Using CFAX back then, it was the equivalent of like, I guess like Tinder or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not quite. Sorry, sorry. Hang on. Are you, are you cup tight? <laughs> when the draw was made, Leicester versus Wick and Wonders, I think we had this thought in our heads, wow, we're in the semi final before we got there. Wickham take the stage for this showpiece FA Cup tie with a team of understudies with half a dozen senior players injured. Anyone fit plays. May went one up. We equalised. I was taken off in the game. I I done my college. And we get the most blatant handball. I see it and I'm I'm shouting at the referee and I'm walking. I'm thinking every step I take is going to cost me another hundred quid. And Laurie Sanchez is a, well he's been sent off. 
Oh, that's a disappointment for the Wickham manager. Perhaps the angriest a manager has ever got in a slightly damp olive trench coat. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the in the change room thinking it's going to be a replay. Um, and then I hear Laurie Sanchez screaming. So I'm actually watching on the TV where it goes up front, last minute of the game, literally last minute of the game. Oh, yes! He's Sando! Unbelievable! Imagine if that happened now. It would be the story of not just the weekend, but the season. Steve Bennett checks his watch. Oh, it's all over. Wickham are in the semi-finals of the FA Cup. That was the only goal that Roy scored that season, and he's a centre forward. You definitely got to remember the name Roy Asin, though. That is a legendary thing to do, you know. It's a shame he never got another goal, though. His name is in FA Cup folklore now forever, Roy Asin Doe. All that is just the beginning. And looking even further ahead, there's the really exciting possibility of using a domestic television receiver as a home computer terminal. So there we are, back at the new Wembley. Chelsea, Manchester United, two outstanding teams. We're going, yes, come on, this will be great. The home of the FA Cup is, is at Wembley, so it was great to get back, and it's where it belongs. What a pig's ear of a game that was. Mikel played that forward to Drogba. It's Drogba again! And Chelsea have scored! And it's DDA Drogba with the first goal in an FA Cup final at the new Wembley! I think that was the start of Chelsea's dominance in the FA Cup, I think. In the next six years, they won four, so Drogba. I uh, played against him numerous times, and you know, such a big, physical, imposing character. Didier is just amazing at adapting to a situation and, and being on form and not letting things get to him. I'm not surprised he scored in every cup final that he's played in, because he's a, he's, a, he's a top centre forward. The little one-two um, on the edge of the box was a very, very neat piece of football. But the finish was sublime, the way the goalkeeper came out and Drogba just sort of lifted over him and, and stroked it into the side of the net. If I could be a little bit critical uh, in this final, is that I think Rio could have done a little bit better. You've got to admit that the, the, the movement and the passing between Lamps and Drogba is, is pretty special. Whenever you lose a, a cup final, like I say, it's, there's no coming back from it and it's end of the season and you know it's not a nice feeling. And you'd have to argue on the day, the goal was far better than the game, but he would have been the only person on that pitch capable of scoring that goal. Throughout the 1970s, the FA Cup threw up some major shocks, and none bigger than in 1978, when Ipswich beat Arsenal. The emotion of the occasion got to Ipswich striker Roger Osborne, and while celebrating his winning goal, he jumped up and down so much, he came over a little peculiar. You don't get a doctor, you don't get anyone, frankly, with any medical training. You just get a bloke coming on with a sponge, and it seems to work as well. Being revived with smelling salts is a bit weird. Like, it's a bit Victorian. Was Dr Cripp in there? Did he have a hanky with his initials on them? I just can't imagine that happening to a footballer now, unless they lost a sponsorship deal. So, in the very moment of glory for him, Roger Osborne, the goal scorer, leaves the field. It's a bit like when you're a kid at a birthday party and you get too excited to make yourself sick. You have to go and sit down. It's like he was having the best time and then he got so excited that he had to be subbed off. <laughs> you never been so excited you make yourself no, sick at a birthday no, party? No, I'm never inviting you to my birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> they often talk, don't they, about, you know, they say, scoring an FA Cup goal is, you know, it's better than... Yeah. yeah. Well, let me tell you that sometimes when I... Hey, there's been smelling salts involved, you know, they've had to revive me, they've carried me off, they've put me in a room, and then gentlemen in shorts have arrived later on. Score the goal. I've scored a goal in an FA Cup final. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you look at fixtures in the FA Cup and you, we're all up for a shock as, as soon as a fixture comes out, as soon as a draw's made, and there was this Norwich loot, and you think, nah. You know, it's something loot and nil. This is Fleetwood. O'Donnell's calling for it. And he's on the charge. Got Rendell in the centre. Lawless arriving at the far post. It's there! Rendell! 
Conference side Luton lead at Premier League Norwich. I think in terms of FA Cup giant killings for me, I think that's probably the best I've ever witnessed. Whilst Luton's victory is fresh in people's minds, the FA Cup has always thrown up surprises. In 1976, as the country basked in a heatwave, the nation got ready for Manchester United to dispose of second division Southampton. Laurie McMenemy had other ideas and his team soaked up the pressure, scoring a late controversial goal to cause one of the most unexpected wins in the history of the FA Cup. Now was he offside when that ball was played? They'll complain for years possibly about that, but when he got there, with seven minutes left for play, he slotted it in. I'm a Man U fan, but that, I guess, is the beauty of the FA Cup. Definitely. Uh, mm. No matter what league you're in, you've got a chance of winning it, and yeah. mm. it produces shock results. When you remember that final, the thing that we always pops out is uh, uh, Ray Powell's goal. Looks to an awful running by Ray Parler here. Paula got a chance and we all thought shoot because normally when he shoots he doesn't hit the target. <laughs> That's a bit strong, isn't it? Hitting hope. Uh, no, well, I've done it every day in training. I mean, but to do it in a big game like that is uh, extra special. I remember Lee Dixon celebrating behind the goal because he was warming up and as it's going in, he's, Dickhoff puts his arms up, he's like, yes! Loads of people have got nicknames. Occasionally you come up with a beauty and whoever came up with Romford Pelé was a genius. It was in training one day and um, I went around about three or four players, not big Dennis Bergham. And little Mark Overmars ran past me and said, uh, you are like the Romford Pelé. And I said, you don't even know where Romford is, do you? If he's the Romford Pelé, then I'm the Romford Maradona. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've, you know, Pelé is Pelé, isn't he? He's a, what, a, what a great goal scorer. I've been privileged enough to interview Pelé a couple of times. And the first time I interviewed him, <laughs> I was desperate to know if he'd ever heard of the Romford Pele, and he never had. Welcome to Match of the Day, and we start by toasting the happiest man in football tonight, Harry Redknapp, the manager of Bournemouth, who this afternoon beat cup favourites Manchester United 2-0. I think we'd had one or two injuries before the game, um, but we were, you know, we were still a strong side going down there. Big run had a good side at Manchester United as well and played really good football. But I think it's, it would appear that they just took this game a little bit too lightly. I mean, the stories are going about, you know, they were watching the racing before the match and all those kind of things. So from Harry Redknapp's point of view, he goes in and tells his boys they're not interested. Every time the FA Cup comes round, there he throws that one in from somewhere. The ball was goalkeeper sold by the owner of a local pizza place. Hey, if you keep a clean sheet, you're going to get free pizza for the rest of your life. So he keeps a clean sheet and he starts getting pizza whenever he wants until... Harry Redknapp buys the pizza shop. That's like the cruelest joke. Free pizza is for life, Harry Redknapp. Not until you buy the restaurant and decide to not give away free pizza anymore. Maybe the keeper had a weight problem. I don't know, but a fantastic result for Bournemouth, most certainly. I mean, one of the big upsets as well. Sorry, mate. <laughs> you, you know you can't do an impression of Harry Redknapp. <laughs> well, you say that, but I don't think <laughs> I quite like the look of that boy. <laughs> Harry will have had his knockbacks in the FA Cup, but he does like throwing that one in. <laughs> I quite like the look of that boy. Is that his catchphrase? <laughs> that's that's red not skating for players, isn't it? <laughs> it's got to be the greatest day in my life, and I'm sure the greatest day in the, the lives of all the players. And, uh, <laughs> it was just, it, it, you know, it's, it's a great afternoon for everybody in Bournemouth. We're delighted. Amazing. The gaff hasn't changed one bit, has he? Yeah, right. Joking aside, people do make their name in the FA Cup, though, don't they? Of course you can, but not always for the right reasons. Some people are remembered for their heroics, other people for their blunders. Yeah, well, things don't always go to plan, especially here on a football pitch at Wembley. When the pressure's on, things go wrong. Most people, if they talk about me in the FA Cup final, they don't mention the fact that I did score or we got to the final, they mention my miss. Number eight, Howlett. Chipping one in for Gordon Smith. I always remember walking up at half time and looking up in, uh, at the scoreboard and it was uh, Brighton, uh, Hope Albion won Manchester United 0 and my name was up on the scoreboard and I thought, 
at least I'll be the member for this game and uh, unfortunately I am. <laughs> <laughs> the game's drawn to all and Gordon Smith gets this incredible chance to win the game. Yeah, ball played for to Robinson. Robinson going forward strong. He's inside the Manchester United penalty area. He finds Smith and Smith must score and he hasn't scored and Bailey has saved it. I have to say that you know I take full responsibility for my miss because I, I actually should have scored. But looking back now, I would have done it differently. I, I should have probably gone for a corner. Just I, I should have opened my body out like you would do in a penalty kick, as if I was going to play it safe with, into his left hand side and fire it across him into the far corner. I made a mistake there. It was a bad miss, and I take full responsibility for it. Obviously, had he scored, beaten United, won the cup, career change for good, more money, more fame. And Gordon Smith will remember that moment for a very, very long time indeed. I'll tell you when I became aware, it was quite uh, interesting. I, I was with Manchester City at the time, and we were over in Kuala Lumpur on a tour. And we were sitting at the pool one day, just sunbathing, and there was a little kid came round getting autographs. And uh, he came to me, and I was lying with my eyes shut, and I, I took his book from him, and I signed it. And I said, yeah, thank you. And he, I closed my eyes. And this little kid, must have been about 11 or 12 years old, said, you are Gordon Smith? And I said, Yes, and he goes, how are you missing cup final? <laughs> and I thought, it's not going to be forgotten. <laughs> Some things are not a fluke with Gianfranco, and this is not a fluke. So to take, what a good corner, but still turned in brilliantly by Zola. Wow, he looked like a back heel into the net. I think magician is a, is a really a right nickname for, for Gianfranco Zola because because he was a magician on a football pitch. Oh, look at that! That was sensational! Look at that! I've seen two or three since that are similar, but I'd never seen a back-heeled volley before. You just thought, how's he done that? Straight in the garden, <laughs> try and try it out yourself. And then he does the nicest thing ever, which is to score the most remarkable goal he can, do something special for a kid who, unfortunately, he visited and was quite sick and unfortunately died before this match. But he'd said, I want to do something special for you. And he really pulled out the stops. That was something that I was uh, looking for for a couple of weeks because I had promised something special to a friend of mine, a small child. His name is, um, is, was Matthew. And uh, I went to see him uh, to the hospital. And, uh, and I said to him, look, I have to, you have to wait because I'm going to promise something, I promise I'm going to give you, to you something special. Unfortunately, you couldn't see him. Probably, I hope he, he will see from somewhere else. Oh, look at that. That was sensational. I'm a very straight man, but David Ginola is a good-looking boy. Ginola, the ladies loved him. Just the name, just the way you say it just sounds good, doesn't it? He had that joie de vivre, he had panache, he had brioche in his house. <laughs> <laughs> now he is a rock star, isn't he? You know he goes on nights out in Crete and that and just like gets fish bowls and stuff. He'll still be going for him. And you, know, you talk about swagger and style and fashion. Like he, he brought that to football, he had that. People always refer to him with his ooh la la and because I'm worth it and his hair, but we can't forget that wonder goal in 99 against Barnsley. I wouldn't be surprised if at the time of this tie, David Ginola had never heard of Barnsley. David Ginola, used to be David Ginola, but when he started doing stuff like this, we have to start calling him David. Ginola, easily passed the defender and passed Blackmore, and round the tail! Oh, that's a wondrous goal! My goal actually was going right through the defence in a, in a quite straight line. The most important was for me to keep the ball a, 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 as close to my feet as possible. I opened my right foot and I put the ball uh, in the back of the net. He scored that incredible goal and then he took off his shirt. Not so sure about that grandpa vest underneath, but we'll just disregard that. The air popping out, shorts pushing up to his nipples. David. Should have looked in the mirror at that one, shouldn't you? Well, well, in the winter I used to wear a vest, yeah. It wasn't the, the, the prettiest one, but uh, uh, it kept myself quite warm. It's like a baggy vest. <laughs> the kind of thing like a pension would wear in bed. <laughs> he spoils it. <laughs> he spoils it. The vest spoils it. Do any of you guys wear vests? No, we don't wear vests. He's French, mate, he probably gets loads of girls. Yeah. 
Yeah, we get loads of girls, don't we? Mm, nah. Not as nah. as French people. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show that that's the, that that's the delicate balance of sexy. <laughs> you can look fantastic. As soon as you pop your shirt off on a vest, it's like, oh, I've got a headache. <laughs> Chinnler seems able constantly to push back the boundaries of just what's possible. At Barnsley, this goal was just a celebration and, and I was very light. I could have took everything off. Some old couple from Barnsley in the crowd and she nudges him and goes, Hey up Ron, you've got one like that. Try that when we get home. It might well be the best save in FA Cup history. It's extraordinarily good. Top goalkeepers can intimidate forwards. Um, Peter was like that, and and definitely David Seaman was like that. It was my, my 1,000th game, and it was special for me to go out because I was captain for the day, and it ended up being my last game. We weren't playing that well. Then we got a goal. Lumpen! And Angela scored! Then I'm thinking, right, you know, kill me, hang on, and then, you know, I'll make my save. You know, just that. <laughs> that save. <laughs> Page again, the chance to hook it in, and it's not gone in, and it's stay out, the starter can't believe it. I was uh, doing punditry for BBC that day, so I'm actually sat there watching the line, and I couldn't believe that he, he made that save. A starboard's volley, and then Tesco Solido, and Seaman, what a magnificent save! I just remember it, the ball coming in and then like shifting side to side, and then realising that the ball had then got back to Pesky Scalido, who was like, open goal. And he headed it, and I don't think he got the best contact on it, but that enabled me to, to really arch back. The thing is, with that kind of save, is if you stop the ball, it's absolutely fantastic. But he, he didn't that. He got his hand to it, and actually, it was like a throw. It was just stunning. What can you say about the veteran goalkeeper? A fabulous save. It was great to prove a lot of people wrong, you know, because I was thinking I was about 39 when I made that save, you know, and I got a decent air style and a tash. <laughs> you don't see much ponytails these days and moustache, <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting mix. Moustache down like a you know, Mexican bandit. I wasn't sure about the ponytail. Well, jealousy is a terrible thing, Tom, because <laughs> I always... <laughs> I always think, oh, a bald man doesn't like a man's ponytail. What a surprise. <laughs> I was one half of that look with a ponytail, but I never quite went for the moustache. I think moustache and a ponytail, hmm, hard combination to pull off that. David Seaman, I think he's just like, he was the porn star of football, wasn't he? That's what he was going for, I reckon, David Seaman. Seaman, Seaman. You know, like the kid in school that's like the goalkeeper, and he's proper garbage, but you never give him any grief because he always brings his gloves and offers to go and goal. So it, to me, it was like that. I never ever thought Seaman was good, but I always was like, well, fair play to him, he's going in there, you know what I mean? I would put David Seaman down. He was, was probably the best goalkeeper that I played with. The most important thing about that save is the guy who followed the rebounding blazed it over the bar, and it was an easy chance. He scores that, my save never gets mentioned. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Allen was the youngest player ever in an FA Cup final at that time. Looking again. Oh, that's beautifully done, Allen. Now, can the 17-year-old take them on? He can. And it is through. Oh, what a pity. A cynical foul by Willie Young. And fully deserving of the yellow card it got. The 17-year-old might have made a storybook finish there. I think at that time, I think referees were much more reticent to issue a red card and, and send players off. It's, it's so commonplace now, but red cards were actually, you actually commit a major offence to get a red card back in 1980. And that was an absolutely direct chance of a shot on goal and spoiled by the worst sort of professional foul. That brute that was Willie Young scythed him down. And I don't think he even went for it. He should have been sent off. Could you imagine that? In today's day as well, and certainly with, with an FA Cup where you know hundreds of millions of people are watching, it was a bit of a nothing game to be honest, and it'd be always remembered for Sir Trevor's header. Oh, Devonshire's round the back. Oh, right across, it's free. Driven in, and is it a goal? It is. Trevor Brooking. The ball ricocheted in off him, and West Ham are in front. It's one of the stranger headers that you will see because, in fact, it is quite brilliant because he, he is falling backwards and it hit him on the head. 
and it went in. Sorry, Trev. Um, but they all count, don't they? I never remember him heading a ball in his life, let alone scoring, and to score in the FA Cup final as well, when I'm still convinced he was trying to get out of the way of it. We had a lovely trip home from Wembley that day. We all went down there on a flatbed truck, and we decided to do a little detour down through Islington, because they all had their street parties all sorted out the Gooners. They were so going to win it. So we had big loudspeakers on the flatbed truck, and just uh, they got a bit of bubbles, put it that way. There were all these little gooners sitting there, eating their jelly. <laughs> we were dancing their way through Islington. Every programme I ever present, when people say, who do you want to get on as a guest, I always say Trevor Sinclair. <laughs> because you can say, Trevor Sinclair is with us. Remember this goal? Spencer's cross comes in. And the shot! Oh! Magnificent! That is brilliant! We'd been working hard in that game and I was blowing a little bit and I thought, well, I can't bring this down, it's too difficult to control. I might as well just go for it. The man has overhead kicked it in from 30 yards. There will never be a better goal than that. If you asked a lot of the players at the time, they would say, well, Trevor used to try overhead kicks in training quite often, so they wouldn't have been surprised that I went for it. Should we see it again? Go on, show it again. Go on. And the shot! Oh! He's not even in the top ten. Who's in charge of this? I'd have to say it's definitely the best goal I've ever scored. Trevor, I feel your pain. Forget this lot, they're a bunch of idiots. Did you ever get the infamous hair dryer treatment from Sir Alex? Yeah, of course. I mean, I remember one time he just stood over me, blew in the face, slobbering over me like a St Bernard. <laughs> Good breath, bad breath? I, did, I didn't get to smell that, I'll be honest with you. I think. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, it wasn't always champagne and celebrations, was it? Well, if it wasn't for a certain Robin Reliant, it might have been a very different story for Fergie and United. It's been an upsetting time for supporters of Manchester United. A power struggle in the boardroom, a lack of success in the league despite big signings. So today's cup tie highly significant and hugely important for the club. It was a strange game, to be fair, because it was a game where... It wasn't about the FA Cup, even though it was an FA Cup game, it was about if we lost that game, would Alex Ferguson lose his job? The whole cup run was almost like his job was hanging by a thread and this was keeping him going. Shouldn't be saying this, but I was actually in the pub. I was in the Bull's Head in Swinton, <laughs> watching it. Uh... <laughs> and I remember the camera con continually on Fergie and he looked a haggard man. Everyone wanted him out of the job. Everyone thought he was going to get sacked and, and Mark Robbins scored a, a, a brilliant goal. And here's Robbins! Is now one of those goals that goes down in folklore as being the moment that Alex Ferguson's career was saved at Manchester United. And when you think of the possibility that he could have been sacked then, and all that emanated, you know, in the 90s and then into the 2000s in his success and silverware, that wouldn't have happened. United are through some joy at last for Alex Ferguson. The goal scores; they go on and win the FA Cup and Fergie time goes on for 26 years. Mark Robbins, I salute you. Congratulations to Spurs, who in 1961 did the double for the first time since Preston North End had done it way back in 1889. It was Spurs who took all of the plaudits that day, but spare a thought for poor Len Chalmers, Leicester's right back. Side two. Chalmers is gone down and he's hurt. A tackle with Allen. Uh, McClintock rolling in agony, but it's Jones with it. The injury to Chalmers was one in a catalogue of Wembley injuries caused by the lushness of the turf where they caught their foot and twisted something, although there had been a challenge, which I think today what probably would have been contested. Well, it would appear the two trainers are on there with him now and, and they're tapping his shin bone. There was a tremendous crack when he went down and I'm wondering if it might be a suspect break. There was no substitutes, so you had two choices. You played with ten men or you put him out on the wing as a passenger. It looks as if Lynn Chalmers is going to get up He's refusing to go off. He must be in terrible pain. Back to the game now. So, Motti, would footballers play on with a broken leg today? No, because a sub would be on. I think it has to have been the most dramatic five-minute period of, of any cup final. wouldn't say the first 85 minutes were completely devoid of, of good football. There was some in there, and Arsenal were easily the better side, 2-0 up. And then with five minutes to go, United suddenly got...
got from somewhere a bit of inspiration. Left for Koppel. Thomas almost got a flick on, appeals for Hansa against Jordan. And McQueen! Jordan McQueen turned it in! United have scored with just under four minutes to go. Nobody expected them to get back to 2-2, but those last, I don't know, five, ten minutes of the game, it was utter madness. OK, they called it the five-minute final. I understand why, because the last five minutes was gripping. Right across, Sunderland! It's there! It's 3-2! Arsenal are back in front for Alan Sunderland. Alan Sunderland's face, the pure joy writ large as he ran away with his head back, screaming. Possibly one of the greatest cup final celebrations ever. I think in the build-up, being a bit of a football snob, you looked at Middlesbrough Chesterfield and thought, not that bothered about that. Burrow win easily, but Chesterfield produced one of the one of the finest semi-final performances you could see. And Chesterfield were two 0 up, playing against ten men. Borough came back. Really, they should have at least had a better chance to go through because, yeah, they had one cruelly taken away. It's just a surprise to me that goal line technology, Hawkeye, the rest of it, wasn't invented in Chesterfield because had it been in operation then, well, they might have been in the cup final. Wembley Stadium, May 1927. Nearly 40 years have gone since the crowds, many thousands of them from the Principality, packed the stands to see their teams presented to King George V. A proud moment for the captains, Charles Button of Arsenal and Fred Keener of Cardiff City. The Cardiff Arsenal game is famous because of the referee wearing a bow tie, which simultaneously created the infamous chant, the referees I think all referees should wear bow ties. Like, we lost our manners. In fact, the bow tie should spin whenever they're making a decision. The referee is either on his way back from, it could be the walk of shame he's done. You know, he's been in a morally bone the night before with the young lady of the night. And then suddenly it happens. Ferguson gets possession of the ball. A first time shot. Lewis fumbles and Cardiff have scored. The, the goalkeeping error is like still spoken about to this day. Yeah. You think poor Dan Lewis, that was it, that was his that was his life then. That was his claim to fame. Sorry boss, I twisted on my new jersey. <laughs> oh you did, did you? Oh in which case it's fine. <laughs> I don't care that Cardiff won. Now, if you play football and your team is lucky enough to get to a cup final, you don't just have to be a brilliant soccer player, it helps if you can sing too. In 1987, Coventry City were massive underdogs. Armed with a catchy little song and a job lot of baby blue tracksuits, they took on Spurs. Those two clubs went out on the Wembley pitch that day and they just went for it. 87 was probably the worst day of my life, uh, in, term, in, in, fo in, in football terms. The goal that I, I remember most about that cup final, the one which, for me, would be worthy of winning any game, was the header by Keith Houchin. <laughs> It was a classic old-fashioned centre forwards diving header about, what, three feet off the ground? That perfect height between the defender and the goalkeeper. I think Keith Houchin, if he's honest, he'd probably tell himself that he thought, Oof, I've got no chance of getting to that unless I fling myself at it. I threw myself at it and obviously I was there in plenty of time and I could actually see where the goalkeeper was and see where the goal was. It was a matter of getting, on, getting it past the keeper and, uh, and getting it on target. Pickering's in the centre, Regis joining him. <laughs> I remember stood right behind the ball and the only place it could have gone in was between the, the crossbar and the post and Ray Clements's hand, and it did. In the end, it was somewhat unfortunate, um, in a way, that it, that it had to be settled by an own goal, which it was with, with Gary Mabbott. To this day, I don't, I don't even know how we lost that game. We were so, so mad at favour. We had such a wonderful, wonderful team. 
Ideally, it would have been Keith Houchin's header that won it, but it wasn't. But that is the moment that stands out from that final. I know because I've seen it enough times, things can change in the dying moments of a game. But surely, if you're 3-0 up at half-time, they've had a player sent off, you get a bit cocky in the dressing room, you can start to think about the next round, can't you? No, 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 no. not in the FA Cup. You've got to be focused, just like the first half, go out there and finish the job off. Because this FA Cup becomes a roller coaster ride. Just watch this. This game was just mad. Tottenham in the first half were just so far in front of Manchester City, you think this, this game could be anything in terms of the score. And that's Ziga! Well, he did fancy it and puts Tottenham 3-0 up. And you imagine Kevin King gets in at half-time and he's thinking, what am I going to do about this? And Joey Barton walks in and says, eh, boss, can I have a word? I've been sent off, walking off the pitch. And Elk is injured and he must have thought, do you know what? Can't get any worse. And how can you come back away from home with a man less, three goals down? I think at half-time there's a lot of people looking at themselves in the mirror and, and, and quite severely um, dressing themselves down. And then it just starts happening. Oh, it's there! The stand was there! And Manchester City are not finished yet! Came out second half and it was a totally different performance. We had a lot of desire and we had a lot of uh, pride and we, we were hurting and I think that the way the lads brought it back, I think, um, showed a, a great team spirit and a great will to put a good display on and give them travelling fans something to shout about. This is Fowler. Oh, and right, Phillips is the onside. The lightroom says yes. And is this 3-3? It is. And there was no flag. And Sean Wright Phillips has put the 10 men level. They got back to 3-3 with Sean Wright Phillips. And you're sort of thinking, OK, replay, what a comeback. And then John Macken. Macken's coming in. He scored. Astonishing. Would you possibly have believed this? Jonathan Mappin has made it 4-3 to Manchester City and almost certainly not Spurs out of the FA Cup. Floodlights were on. Ten men giving it their all, coming from behind. It was, it was a bit like dogging, really, wasn't it? When you think of the players City have got now, you, you can't even imagine that they would have had a player like John Mackin on their books, but he did a decent job for City and plenty of other teams and that was undoubtedly his finest moment in a Sky Blue shirt. And you could play that game a thousand times, and 999 of them, you would never ever come back from three down with ten men and win it. But they did on that occasion. I'd have loved to have known what he said to them at half time. He probably actually said, Look, boys, we can't do any worse. Sometimes that works. It worked that day. You've got players like, you know, Ron Chopper Harris on one side and Norman Bites Your Legs Hunter. It was just so dirty. It's exactly what you want from Chelsea Leeds. That's what I like about it is you think, OK, it's going to be Chelsea Leeds, it's going to be a dirty final. Oh, it really is going to be a dirty final. <laughs> they're like, not messing around. They're not messing around. No, they're getting into it. And that's, they absolutely delivered. And Osborne and Brenda. And oh, Hutchinson right into Brenda. There was no excuse for that. And he must be booked. There are some incredible fouls in that game that, I mean, how it didn't end with, like, three aside, I don't know. You could have done without a ball for probably 68 minutes because it was just vendettas, it was everybody getting the retaliation in first, but that's the way that football was and they, they were tough boys and, and when they were kicked they got up but they kicked you back. Jones! The net is hurt. That was like a Saturday night at Yates's Wine Lodge. It was just all kicking off. Players used to be able to jump into the goalkeeper and force him into the net, and they'd be given the goal. I'm not saying to go back to that, but, you know, it's a physical sport. And then, throw it down. Yes, a goal. Win. There's been this thing now, hasn't there, where they've, they've analysed the game afterwards, and for fun, David Ellery's watched a game from 40 years ago and gone, actually, there should have been so many yellow cards. Oh, come on, David, surely you've got trains to spot, haven't you? Don Revy's Leeds getting knocked out at Colchester. I mean, when you think about the FA Cup and everyone talks about the underdogs, 
and um, the cup winning exploits. It's not too far away from where I live. I remember the celebrations as well when a guy scored the goal and he's running around and the fans, them days it was all standing and the atmosphere was, was superb. To beat Leeds 3-2, to score three goals against them, all conquering Leeds was a fantastic performance. That's what the FA Cup's all about. That's why we love it so much. We want upsets. You don't want to be involved in an upset as a player, but you want to see that because that's what, what, what the Cup's all about. So the 23 FA Cup final, the White Horse final, where the uh, crowd spills onto the pitch and is kept into control by, by a man on a horse. The arena was supposed to hold 125,000 people. The programme boasted how good the uh, stadium was going to be, but on the day, twice as many people as that turned up. It wasn't an all-ticket match, and some 250,000 there got inside Wembley, as a result of which the policeman on the white horse, George Scorey, had to restore order, and they delayed the kickoff for 45 minutes. It's interesting, really, because, you know, we often denigrate the prawn sandwich brigade, you know, where have the real fans gone? But if you see it early on, there's evidence here it's the top hats versus the flat caps, isn't it, in many ways? It's like a classic north-south clash, you know? If they were to make a film of it now, it would probably have Danny Dyer there in a flat cap calling everyone a toilet, and then Peter Kay with, like, a cup of Bovril pretending to be poor. And, of course, hundreds of thousands of people on the pitch. One white horse comes on, disperses the crowds. People were just more polite then, weren't they? If a white horse asked you to do something, you just did it. One man on a white horse manages to send everyone back. Yeah. It's like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> the only time Bolton get a bit of limelight, get to the FA Cup and, and a white horse takes the attention away. Apparently there's over 200,000 million people there. My main concern, which no one talks about, is what were the states of the toilets? And what were the queues of toilets like? That's my number one problem with going to see sport. And it's never referred to. It's like, oh, look how many people there were there. You go to need a toilet once, that's half the match gone. I said never trust a man in a flat cap. That's what I say. This is not a flat cap, it's a baker boy. There's a difference. This was when Everton were just coming into fruition as, as the top team in England, which they arguably were for three or four years. And Elton John was the owner of, of, of Watford in those days. He was, he was their chairman. He just got married, hadn't he? And I think he was alongside his wife, which was uh, in itself something to obviously remember. Elton John, chairman of Watford, added another dimension to the occasion, and his reaction to Abide With Me, which was sung with emotion and enthusiasm, was memorable. He got upset, and you know, and that's that's what happens in the FA Cup. The whole kind of emotion of the occasion, the hundred thousand people, and he he just broke down. The big story was what for getting there, wasn't it? Really, as much as anything else, and could they do it against um, the strong favourites that were Everton? Gray and Sharp waiting in the centre, and Gray is closing in here. Oh, and Sherwood didn't connect, and the goal is given. The challenge of Gray, too much for the goal. heartbreaking for him uh, and I'm sure he would still if you asked him now his eyes would light up and, and he'd talk about Andy Gray's goal being a foul on Steve Sherwood. The new LP shortly to be released by Elton John is called Broken Hearts. There might be one or two of those around Watford tonight. Just shows what the, the FA Cup and the final meant to people that somebody like Elton John, multi-millionaire, one of the biggest stars in the world at the time as he is still now here at Watford this is this is what he really loves. I haven't been to Wembley twice and lost twice in FA Cup finals. Wembley is not a very nice place to be when you haven't uh, when you haven't won the competition. I can uh, I can assure you of that. People involved in the losing team, whether it's the players, whether it's the management, whether it's the owner, whether it's the supporters, it's the worst feeling ever. Oh, bless him! That gets me a bit. That. That's football, Helen. It's an emotional game. Move on. All right. Anyway, we've got 20 more amazing FA Cup moments to go. Here's what's coming up. The best thing for me in the FA Cup is trying Kenny. Bradford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! The day of the final is special. There's nothing like it. I'm now a way to get my suit measured. Yes! You open it up and it's this cream suit. You can pull off those short shorts. You can pull off that hair. I just remember seeing his legs way above his head. Oh, my God, Giggs is hairy! <laughs> <laughs> 
that's what ruined it for me, the cartwheel. It wasn't good enough, was it? Well, what do you think, Ellen? Classy or what? Yeah, I mean, classy's one word. I don't think a lot of people could pull it off, but you look great. Well, I wasn't too convinced, if I'm honest. But for a celebrity wedding or fancy dress or something like that would be okay. Listen, FA Cup final day, you want to go unnoticed. This it's... is for FA Cup final day? Yes. No. <laughs> Would you believe it? This gruffy bunch has reached the third round of the FA Cup. I know. Whole town's talking about it. Smarten them up a bit. I want to be real proud when we walk out to inspect the pitch at Wembley. Can't touch this. I've got to be honest, I think they got the colour wrong. I do. I think they got the colour wrong. It's like a bit like rain, eh? It will be a trouble. <laughs> If you would do it now, maybe it would be different, but it, 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 that was a huge mistake. You get given your suit and a suit carrier with your name on it, you don't do it, you open it up and it's this cream suit. I mean, whose idea was it for them to turn up in them cream suits? I swear, the crowd thought we were the band when we walked out. There was just a silence in there. There was like no cheering. And they must have been thinking, oh, this is the band, they've just walked out. And it was like, that was it, because these these cream suits. I can't remember a band coming out of Wembley wearing cream suits, red ties and sunglasses. Nah, I don't think so, Jason. When I first saw it, I didn't think that it was, it was that bad. I thought, you know, people wear cream suits all the time. I just think when there's 20 lads all together in, in cream suits, it probably looks a little bit different. If you walk on the pitch in a white suit, you're saying, yeah, I'm that good. I can wear a white suit because you've got to already think that you're halfway up the steps collecting the trophy to be wearing a white suit. I'm cocky, OK. <laughs> we will learn. <laughs> when we seen the suits, we had a little chuckle to ourselves and then I went over to, to Russia. I went, Russia, what's going on? He went, nothing to do with me. Don't wear cream suits if you're not in the, for the ice cream industry or, like, I don't know, pet burial. They look like lottery winners when they go to their family with still Paul's wedding and just dress a bit inappropriately. And I've got to admit, I thought at one point, we actually looked all right. And what are they thinking? Springtime, cream suits, nice. I'm still on the lookout for a cream suit, man. I might buy one after this, man. I've got like a dark brown thing going on, but I ain't got a cream one. It looks silly, but we also said we can't lose to a team wearing, you know, suits like that. James gets there just first. It was a goal that only Eric could score. It was like in slow motion, like one of them Matrix moments where it's coming at you and there's nothing you can do about it. The volley, I mean, he's even going backwards as he strikes it and it goes through three or four players and I just remember going absolutely mental. If they'd have won, it would have been fine, no problem at all. But obviously when you lose and you come out with cream, white suits, whatever it was, um, you're going to take a bit of stick. We'd have won the game, we would have looked a million dollars. But we lost the game and looked a million later. At Highbury today, there was a hugely controversial incident which had the usually phlegmatic Sheffield United manager, Steve Bruce, raging. A player's down for Sheffield United, the ball wants to be kicked out of play, and they take, they take, they take the throwing quickly. And uh, off we go again, and what is happening here? This is uh, Kanu to Overmars, and Overmars has put the ball in the net. And Sheffield United are furious. I remember the, the, the fans behind me shouting to me, saying, you've got to throw it in the net. That's not, you know, and I was like, I really didn't know what to do, you know, and all the way up for the rest of the game, I was thinking, this can't be right. Well, I think Carla must surely have been trying to get that ball back to Kelly or out of play for a goal kick. Certainly that's the uh, way these things are normally conducted. The ball went out and uh, I picked the ball up and I was just throwing it back to the Sheffield United players and I think Carnu ran after it. He probably didn't understand what was going on. And Mark Overmars was running from the left-hand side. He crossed it and put it into the back of the net and it was nearly a riot. I don't know why we did that. I don't know why for me why we did that. <laughs> I don't think Carnu like, knew that. That's what I'm saying. That, 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 he didn't that, understand it, the whole concept yeah, of it. You always do that. You, know, you yeah. give it back to You him. give it back. We got in the dressing room. A lot of the players were saying, you know, we can't go through on this. Something's got to happen because... You know, you, you don't want to go through like, on, a, on a situation like that where, you know, it's such bad sportsmanship. We are unfortunately uh, scored a, a second goal, but spirit-wise it's not right. We offered to replay the game, 
and uh, to replay it here because uh, we have the feeling we didn't win it like we want to win our games. The game is about honour, man, and respect as well. So that was very noble of him to say, you know, let's let's do a replay and, and, and let's have it again. Some Sheffield United fans thought it should have been replayed at Bramall Lane, but we weren't going to go that far. <laughs> Arsenal have they said they would play the replay. I believe that's the right decision. If it had been mine, I would have done exactly the same thing, and I expect that of Arsenal, yes. If Arsenal hadn't have acted the way that they did, there could have been chaos. But it, I think it showed the, the class of English football, to be fair, that day. To be fair, I don't think Wenger did say it. <laughs> <laughs> no way would Alex Ferguson have done that, or Jose Mourinho. Are you joking? It's unthinkable. He's the only manager who would do that. I do think Arsenal did exactly the right thing. Talk about an action in the spirit of the game. Certainly the spirit of fair play. They, they did do the right thing without a doubt. Not many players score in an FA Cup tie, let alone get a hat-trick, but that was exactly what Tim Bozzaglo did for Woking against West Brom in the third round in 1991. Who is this guy? I love the fact that he was an estate agent who played cricket for Gibraltar. Again, that is, that, that is the FA Cup in one man, because he shouldn't be scoring a hat-trick and, and sending Woking through in the FA Cup against the league side, but he did it. I remember he went on, uh, he went on match of the day, didn't he, with Des Lyonham, looked really uncomfortable, and then did Des ask him to say goodnight? Remember, there's only one Tim Bazaglo. Here he is with the match ball. Say goodnight, Tim. Good night. The day of the final is special. There's nothing like it. They were the favourites going into the game. They had the best team. World-class players who were winning World Cups at the time. You know, your Vieiras and your Petits and Henri up front, who was possibly the best player in the world at the time. va va -voom. Mr Henri. Henri is onside, jumps for Arsenal. Thierry Henri will take one to pull back and should he have pulled it back? He's missed the chance. Friends, it was a corner, but the referee's given a goal kick. And he's missed the sitter and it's like the world's ended. It's almost like, can that really happen? I will always replay that play in my head because I'm like, when I hit that ball, I saw Sylvain Wiltord on my left. And if I played Sylvain Wiltord, it would have been 1-0. There's a look on his face, isn't it, as if to say, no, <laughs> wasn't me, it must have been someone else. I mean, looking at Henri, I think it's never going to happen for him. It's never going to happen. What was actually annoying is they gave them a goal kick. We had a great season that season, won all those trophies and finished second in the league, but they were pretty special and, and I think that day they showed it in their superiority for, for the most part of the game. If we'd have lost that cup final 4-5-0, we'd have had no complaints. We were totally bossed for the majority of it. Even the Liverpool players will tell you that final should have been 8-9, 8-9-10 something. And then just getting sucker punched with Michael. You know, it was just so frustrating. Oh, and Rubio gets right in the middle of that. Pushing and shoving. And there's a shot. And there's the equaliser. Michael Owen has done it. With only eight minutes to go, Liverpool the level. You know, when you feel like, I knew that was going to happen, but I didn't know when or I didn't know how. Fox in a box scores the first one and you're like, mate, please, just leave it alone. You know, five minutes to go and it was 1-1 one, one, and... Everyone looking at the prospect of extra time and the blistering heat in Cardiff. Um, but we just had all the momentum and their shoulders slumped and, and we knew it was our time. This is Berger and Robbie Fowler looks sprightly now. He wants the ball played early but so does Owen. And he's getting the other side of Dixon. Michael Owen for Liverpool. Yes! Oh, he's done it! What an incredible few minutes for Michael Owen. Unbelievable stuff. I didn't really think I could score from there, if I'm honest. But I thought, if I take another touch, I'm going to run out of angle, I'm going to have to then chop back, wait for someone to, to come and support me or whatever. And I just thought this is just the time I've got to let fly and hopefully it's uh, accurate. And, and my left foot was never my, my best of friends over the years, but I will never forget it from, from, uh, from doing that in the cup final. It wasn't even like a really hard shot, but it was just like the surprise of it. You know, I just got my fingertips to it thinking I've got it. And then next thing it's in the goal. Surely, David, a bit of this. Straight left arm, son. <laughs> Could have got rid of that. To score a goal back big on a big stage like that, you get lost in the moment. I've done it myself at times with celebrations, and he did as well, but that's what ruined it for me, the cartwheel. It wasn't good enough, was it? There's a time and the place, Michael. Cartwheels are not the correct way, you know, 
to, to celebrate a goal. You're not allowed to call it cartwheel, by the way. He's, he's adamant about that, isn't he? Handspring, apparently. It's a handspring. I don't know where it came from. I'd never done a handspring in 10 years, and the excitement just boiled over into doing something that you've never done before. And it was only afterwards when I looked at the tape, I thought, oh my word, I tried to do a handspring. And thankfully, I landed on my feet, but it wasn't the, the prettiest of uh, manoeuvres. celebrating with two goals from the master marksman that win the 2001 FA Cup. We just had a world-class player in our team who had two fantastic moments that spun the game on its head. And I remember sitting in Cardiff in a coffee shop with my friends and how on earth have we lost that? How have we lost that? We destroyed Liverpool. Well, it's sad there because that final was in our end. I didn't see them scoring or, or whatever and they were resilient and and, uh, and they wanted that was a smashing grab, that was a robbery that day. And the first FA Cup final in Wales is won by a man called Owen. Rio, every footballer must dream about winning this. Yeah, of course. But for some clubs, just knocking out a big team is just as sweet as getting your hands on the trophy, I tell you. Do you mean those games where it's really foggy, you can hardly see, everybody's running around in ankle-deep mud, and the guys who are painters and decorators during the week have knocked out some guys who are on loads of money? Exactly. Now you're talking. That's what this is all about, the FA Cup. It's a dim and dismal Wrexham evening, isn't it? The clouds are gathering, the pitch is a mess. Mickey Thomas steps up. He's 37. He's still got the air. The knees might have gone, but the magic is still in the feet. Thomas who takes it. Oh, what a goal, Mickey Thomas! He's done it, the magic little man at the venerable age of 37. But Mickey Thomas, you know, what a great lad he is as well, and uh, to step up and hit that free kick, probably in Wrexham's history, that is probably the best moment ever. For a 37-year-old to try and get away with that haircut, you're having a laugh, aren't you? Yeah, the hair. I mean, it's great. You know, it's all about barnets in days, isn't it? You know, we all looked at Kevin Keegan, people like that, and. Uh, modelled our barnets on that, as, as they say. I don't know where he got the power from, because his legs don't look <laughs> like he can generate that much power. I'm on the cop celebrating the winner, because I've wrecked some of my team. So for me, one of the best goals I've ever witnessed. And there's the whistle. Wrexham have achieved a really famous FA Cup victory. Always oh, poor old David Seaman being beaten from some distance. But Mickey's would have beaten pretty much any goalkeeper around. Mickey, I've seen you play for a number of those about 12 clubs you've had. I've never seen you hit a free kick like that, though. Well, it's the first time the manager's let me take one, to be honest, Des. So, uh, I mean, I was well pleased, obviously, uh, with the strike. That's, that not right? tr that's not true, Des. He's taken three or four this season. They've ended up in the stand. <laughs> <laughs>
of Manchester City. Early on in my career, I got compared to George Best, and as a 17-year-old, you think, what's going on? If Lionel Messi is thinking of signing for Manchester United, they think, ooh, would I be able to do it on a, on a Tuesday night in Stoke? Have a look at this. This is George Best scoring six goals. All right, the opposition, you know, are not great. He's playing Northampton. But look at the pitch. six in an 8-2 thrashing of Northampton and I mean every way you can with his head with his foot walking running you know dribbling eh, however you want to do it he did it he just glided past players with the ball effortlessly like, like a knife through butter and it was um, you know he was an idol to a lot of people That was George Best, he just had that swagger, he just had that confidence and yeah, the way that he dummied the keeper and smashed it in the net is what he was all about. I mean, he has the audacity and the cheekiness to just walk it around the goalkeeper and then walk it into a net. He can pull off those short shorts, he can pull off that hair, he can pull off those sideburns and you just know he probably had a huge night the night before and he still turns up and he still breaks records and makes history. He looks like he's mad at himself, he's like, he's like... I'm too good. For best to get six on a pitch like Northampton's was, it, I mean, it's beyond belief, really. You get players now moaning about the length of the grass. On, on, you know, and these pitches that you, you look at now, and they look like snooker tables. That's when you start to appreciate what a, a real talent George Best was with the conditions that he played on and the players that he was playing against. Best United player ever. In 1956, when Birmingham took on Manchester City in the FA Cup final, football was proper football, and men were real men, especially City's goalkeeper, Bert Trout. That's Brown. And I think Troutman's hurt. Yes, and so's Murphy. A lot of people do not know the history of Bert Troutman. He's a German prisoner of war, and then he comes out, and then he gets a contract with... Uh, uh, football team and then he ends up playing at Wembley. Looks like Murphy's knee and Trapman's head. The guy's really, oh, oh, my poor knee, oh, oh your oh. neck got on the way on my really hard, <laughs> bony knee. <laughs> Trapman still having trouble with that neck of his. All modern players should be made to watch that footage and say, look, stop rolling around on the floor. Yeah. He has broken his neck. Yeah. And he's going to play on. Now, you know, Ronaldo, if his hair's out of place, he doesn't even continue. His neck, that's his stomach. Well, Fodor Trapman's having a totally tough time. I think players nowadays are just more mollycoddled, aren't they? I mean, you get a grip. You know, back in the day, a bloke with a dodgy jacket and a sponge just wiped your face and hair, and you got on with it. To Brown, this could be a hit. And there goes down Trotman again. He's got another crack on his neck. You know, when you see him, you know he's done something wrong, you know, because he's not, he's reacting weirdly. And, you know, after the game, when you find out he's broke his neck, it's just, it's amazing. That is how popular he is with the Manchester fans, the tremendous cheering. You think in this day and age, they'd be a lot crueler, wouldn't they? <laughs> You've broken your neck, you <laughs> <laughs> And Trump are now receiving that coveted medal, having a word with His Royal Highness. I should imagine he's forgotten all about his bad neck now. Broken neck is not romantic in any way, but this is the romance of the, the FA Cup, that it has stories like that. There's not many times Manchester United go into cup finals as underdogs, but we did that day, although we didn't think so. We, we fancied our chances strongly. Everton had just won the league. We're going for the, for the league and cup double, which not many teams had done prior to that. That was a real, uh, a real unprecedented thing at that particular time. Well, there was two big turning points, really. The football wasn't great that day, but obviously really done as usual, big dive. McGrath, oh, the straight by McGrath, and the throw here, oh! Well, Reed really has been brought down by Kevin Moore. That has to be a booking, at the very least. It looks as though Peter Willis is going to send Kevin Moore off, and we could have a player sent off in the FA Cup final for the first time ever. 
It was unfair, I thought, Kevin getting sent off, and even Reedy himself didn't want Kevin sent off. To say Peter Reed was denied a goal-scoring opportunity when he was something like 40 yards from our goal, he's never ran 40 yards in his life, Reedy. Poor Kevin Moran copped it, didn't he? Even though, these days, you could definitely argue it wasn't an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. But that was a massive turning point, and, and for us, we just um, looked at each other, actually thinking, what is going on here? We have to do something about this. Side. That's all he's got. Whiteside shoots. It's there. Marvin Whiteside again. I think Neville Southall had a cap or a, a towel on the on the side netting because I'm sure Norman said I just aim for his towel. <laughs> it was it was it was unstoppable. The youngest scorer in Wembley FA Cup final history two years ago. He's still only just 20, and he writes another chapter. People said. Did he mean it? I saw him do that many, many times in training. I mean, he, he was brilliant at that. I mean, I tried it all the time in training, but I, I never, um, it never worked, but it worked on the big day, thank God. The FA Cup semi-final at Hillsborough in 1989 will always be remembered as a time when football didn't matter, as 96 fans tragically lost their lives. Some people said that the final between Liverpool and Everton shouldn't have been played, but it was the next month, and it turned out to be a classic that brought a grieving city together. This should have been the final that didn't matter. It was really of no consequence to anybody. That FA Cup final was when the city came together as one, and. United really in what was a huge tragedy and so many so many people lost their lives going to watch a, a game of football. It was fitting because it was a Liverpool final against Everton in our travels and then it was the closest final that we've ever been in. It was a hard game to play emotionally obviously because of what was what had gone on before. Fans mixed from moment one all the way through. You'll never walk alone was just a, an amazing moment. I don't think I've ever been at a game where, you know, one song, You'll Never Walk Alone in this instance, A, was, was sung by both sets of supporters, but was just, it was just absolutely fantastic. And there are moments in your life where you, you sit there and you take things in and there's that, that, almost that little pause and you go, did that actually happen? And it did. I still had an air of the strangeness about it, but once, once it starts, it's, you still want to win. It was a great game as well, which nobody was bothered about to start with, but it was fitting. It just worked, and only Liverpool and Everton could have played that game. It was as though, because of Hillsborough, the shackles were off, and it was like, you know, it's two Merseyside teams. We owe it to people to show what we are all about after Hillsborough, and boy, did they. Ratcliffe. Watson's up. Here's McCall again. Oh, yes! It's 2-2! Two -two. A bit more of an emotional final, obviously, because of the events of, of Hillsborough, and I think someone was looking down us on, on us that day because Everton were terrific, and... The game went to the wire again, but we managed to sneak over the line. Rush! Go! 3-2 Liverpool! Ian Rush gets his second! Again, Rushy turns on Everton and does, does the business. You speak to the lads now about that cup final, and, and yet it was fitting that Liverpool and Everton come, but they'll tell you they wanted to win it for the fans, but their hearts weren't in football. In a fine, dramatic final, surely lifted the spirits of a whole city and of the game of football. It was a hard-fought game, and for Merseyside, it was one of the games that uh, Everton can be proud, uh, as well as ourselves. It was very, very difficult game to actually play in, um, and one that you think that you're never going to win. I thought both sets of supporters on the day really, you know, made made Merseyside proud and. Yeah, it was a bit of a different FA Cup final because it had an emotional twist to it. In many, many ways, you know, that, that football was the winner that day because it was just a fantastic game. For now, that, that victory is for the 96. A terrible tragedy, but an incredible response by the players and fans made for a great final. 
Absolutely. Time now to count down the top 10 greatest FA Cup moments, starting with another great final, arguably the greatest ever. Leeds United were such strong favourites. Sunderland were, were a team of well, hardly anybody that ever heard of any of their players at the time. Yes. With the kick. Probably even more talked about than the goal is Jimmy Montgomery's double save, which still is the best cup final save that's ever happened. Leeds are really pushing forward. Terry, brilliant save, and Lola makes it one each. No. Astonishing. Jimmy Montgomery did the business. Thank you very much. Not quite sure how he got to Lorimer's second shot after Trevor Cherry's header, but he did. It was just their day. Goalkeeper was outstanding. They scored the goal that mattered, and their name's on the cup. And you know that's all Sunderland fan cares about. The referee looked at the watch. And Sunderland have won the cup from the second division. I was born 11 days before the 1973 Cup final, and it was my mum's first big day out, as you'd expect after I was born. She talks about it fondly. She's forgotten that Leeds United lost because she had such a good time. <laughs> and I always see those pictures and, and you know, see the footage of that game and feel kind of quite sad that I'd just been born because I think, oh, if only I'd managed to produce a win with my birth. <laughs> um, and obviously it must have been a bittersweet kind of few weeks in the, in the house. My dad had his first child and then he came on and 75 minutes in an FA Cup final and was on the losing side. Dear old Bob Stoker running on the pitch at the end in his white Mac to go and uh, celebrate with Jim Montgomery. Just a fantastic, fantastic moment. <laughs> Vivid memories of this bad boy. And I'm feeling glad all over. Yes, I'm glad all over. Glad all over. Good afternoon to those of you at home, many of you who are able to fully savour it with us this occasion with uh, the crowd inside Villa Park on a very sunny day. Palace Liverpool is possibly one of, well, it is one of the best semi-finals ever. Seven months before, they'd lost 9-0. I mean, that's just, that's not a defeat, that's an absolute annihilation. 9-0 against Liverpool. Nobody really gave them a prayer and up to half time it sort of went as was predicted really. Liverpool very calm, confident, in control of the game. Um, intercepting, Rush going to the left now. Onside, Ian Rush. Liverpool take the lead. And Ian Rush, the ace goal scorer, once again makes it look so easy. Ian Rush scored really early in that game and as a Palace fan, now you can imagine, head in the hands, come on, just keep it to five. And then the game just exploded about five minutes after half-time. John Pemberton went on an unbelievable run, which I don't think he was instructed to do. Well, let's see what Palace can do about it now in the second half as they attack the whole end here at Villa Park. John Pemberton, a lovely run early on. And a shot for Barber and Venison, and it's a shot. And it, it's there by Bright. It's Mark Bright straight from the kickoff. After John Salako's shot didn't quite get there, Bright certainly did. If we were able to time his coverage of distance, I think that's, that's eight seconds for 100 metres right there. Usain Bolt would be a good ten yards behind him. What a dramatic start to the second half, and Liverpool are stunned. There's a shot when Dalglish looks really confused, annoyed, but I think one of the thoughts going through his head is, why on earth am I wearing this massive coat? It's quite hot. Can't take it off now, it looks stupid. There was this air about the second half that anything was possible and that, that we weren't out of the game. This team were ten minutes away from Wembley, let it be said. They're now less than three minutes away from going out. Thomas, and Bright's in there. And Thomas, scores to Gray! Gray, 3-3! Three, three. Andy Gray for Palace, they're back in it! One of the few times I'd seen that Liverpool team look really, really vulnerable at, at the back and uh, and rocks in, in terms of the way they were defending. Thorne puts it on and it's gone in. Pardew, four-three Palace. Alan Pardew, who at that time 
was not a favourite amongst Crystal Palace supporters. He was one of the lesser known players nationally. And up he pops with one of the most famous goals in the Eagles history. And I guess it would have helped make his name for the career in management that he went on to have, because that was undoubtedly the best moment of his playing career. You speak to Palace fans now, and yes, they remember some of the promotions. Yes, they remember some of the great moments, but no one will ever forget that semi-final. And Crystal Palace are at Wembley. They've beaten Liverpool, whose dream of the double is destroyed in one of the most amazing matches, surely, in the recent history of the FA Cup. Whenever a non-league team beats any league team, it's a story, but when there's such a gap between the teams, it's, it, it's one that, that everybody talks about and remembers fondly. Coventry go to Sutton United, and Sutton found it on the day. They've got a chance here to beat a first division side, as it was, who are FA Cup holders. Let's produce a shot. And golly! I've got to remember that Coventry were the winners of the FA Cup two seasons ago, and this is Sutton United. And it was, I, I can really vividly remember my dad saying, Oh, you know, this is a pro he didn't really talk like that, but this is a proper one, this one. Here's Dawson. Oh, and driven in! And number 11, Matthew Hanlon, followed that in. And Sutton have done it again from a corner kick. If that game hadn't happened, then we would never remember the name of Matthew Hanlon, but that was his one moment in time, and he grabbed it. Matthew Hanlon played a big part for Sutton United. I wonder what he's doing now. And there it is! Sutton United of the GM Boxall Conference have put out First Division Coventry City, winners of the FA Cup themselves less than two years ago. OK. Next one. We're all lined up, Blackpool in the dark shirts, kicking off for this 1953 Cup Final, and away they go. Growing up, you could not have Cup Final Day without them talking about the Matthews Final. Don't forget, this was only eight years after the war, and the country was just getting itself back on its feet, and football had been a great catalyst for that. Crowds were huge, and Stanley Matthews was the great hero. He'd had two cracks at the FA Cup, and people were saying in 53, this has got to be Stan's last chance. And he had this opportunity in the cup final. As a veteran, maybe, maybe he could get his medal. And it was a Lancashire hot pot, Blackpool against Bolton Wanderers. Mortensen managed to sort of nudge one in at the far post for 3-2. And then Blackpool were awarded a free kick on the edge of the penalty area. And, you know, we've seen some fantastic free kicks uh, down the last 10, 20 years. But if you look back to that one in 1953, my goodness me, does Mortensen hit it? There he is, Mortensen. It's a lovely goal! Now we were poised for this fantastic climax. 47 seconds to go or something. Matthews has got the ball on the right wing and he's teasing the Bolton left back and he's doing that usual shuffle and then the quick run down the outside, which was Stanley's forte, of course. There's the man who's really fighting for this cup medal. Could he score the winning goal now, himself? He's there! Perry! The stadium went absolutely wild. And of course, people call it Matthew's Cup Final. It was Mortensen's Cup Final, really, because he scored arguably three goals. It should be called the Stan Final. And this is, I, genuinely, I, I wasn't alive, but I'm still angry about this now. I mean, that's wiped me up. It was me, and it was like someone else had got it, and Fennec had got an hat trick. Overrated, I'd say, Sally Matthews. Overrated. Imagine scoring the hat trick and not. I, I mean, I'd, I'd be livid. I'd be absolutely livid. You are livid, and you weren't even there. <laughs> <laughs> There's Stanley, at long last he's done it. And everybody cheering him. And Stanley Matthews winning the FA Cup, it just put the, the, the cap on it, really, especially as he made the last-minute winning goal. It's unquestionably the greatest cup for him. There he is, Matthews. And no one was smiling face. Eddie Shimwell. Gaza is just like the FA Cup, an institution of English football. Paul Gascoigne at that, at that particular time was, was flying. He was one of the best in world football. They say he shouldn't have even played in the game because he wasn't fully fit. He'd just come back from a double hernia or something like that. So, you know, he was another one that loved the, loved the big occasion. Someone had told Gaza, whether it was true or not, that the Arsenal team had been measured up for their cup final suits before the semi-final. 
So he was pretty pumped. Play with, he was great. Play against, he was murder. A free kick just left of centre. He steps up to, to take that free kick. You know, Seaman's in goal. I mean, you're not really going to bet against Seaman from that distance. I was just thinking, yeah, go on then, hit it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'll easy save this. Is Gascoigne going to have a crack? He is, you know. Oh, and he's there! When he strikes that ball and it flies and keeps flying and gliding through the air, I think the whole stadium probably held their breath for a minute there. Is there anything left from this man to surprise us? I did get my studs caught and I held my hands up straight away and, you know, he was like having none of it. No, 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 it was a power in the bend that beat you and everything, but I know. It was just a, a fantastic moment in a, in a huge game and if anyone was going to score a goal like that, then you wanted it to be Gaza. He never ever lets me forget it. I'm happy. I'm now a way to get me shoot measured. Yes! What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> that free kick epitomised him, really, of his career and the way that he was, that he could produce these real moments that, that we could all cherish and watch back in years to come. The whole world watched Gaza, and at times like that, he delivered. No one seems to remember the two goals I scored. Don't you dare go moaning about Lineker not getting enough attention. <laughs> and Lineker uses him by not using him. Good try, score! Who cares, he got two in that game. <laughs> but it was a stinging shot, so it would have probably gone through the hands of many a goalkeeper. So Gaza's heroics takes them to the final against Forrest and then goes in for a tackle, totally mistimed, totally misjudged, injures himself in the process, has to be stretched off, and that's the end of his FA Cup final. So it was a day of mixed emotions, certainly for Gaza. Obviously, he was never quite the same, didn't move quite the same after after that day, but at the same time he was he was part of the side that uh, won the FA Cup and he was the main reason we won the FA Cup. Spurs have won the FA Cup for a record eighth time. Gaza, what a player. His movement, his dribbling, his passing, just an absolute incredible player. He is capable, or was capable, of producing pieces of, uh, of magic, whether that was in a um, Spurs shirt or a Newcastle shirt or even an England ship. What a player just in that year or two while he was at the top of his game was enough to, to make him last in my memory bank for, for a lifetime. What a genius Paul Gascoigne is. I don't want us to make this hammy, but I don't feel like we can talk about the FA Cup without listing a load of cliches. Well, you've got David versus Goliath, giant killings, Hello turf, part-time minnows. You know exactly what I'm talking about, but do commentators have to use at least three of them? No. But they'd all love a Ronnie Radford moment. Prior to 1972, the FA Cup must have been pretty dull, because no FA Cup montage is complete without Ronnie Radford. Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! Radford, the scorer! Ronnie Radford! In that moment, that is, for me, that's, that, that is the magic of the Cup. Cannot beat it. Without Ronnie Radford, there's no John Motson, because that goal made Motson. Of course, it was my first FA Cup tie for the BBC, and being there on that day did me no harm at all. No Motson, no FA Cup. So basically, the whole thing goes back to Ronnie Radford. Without Ronnie Radford, there's no FA Cup. Thank you. <laughs> Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! Radford, the scorer! Ronnie Radford! That's all I concentrated on, and I just hit it, and, and um, you know, it didn't go in car park, did it? A tremendous reply from Radford. The ball sits up, bang! Oh, pitch invasion. The crowd are invading the pitch, and now it will take some time to clear the field. What a tremendous shot by Radford. As soon as it soars in, the next thing is he's just surrounded by green snorkel parkers. <laughs> Like a million paper boys from all around the country. <laughs> I always remember it as the last really peaceful pitch invasion I ever saw, because things got a bit little less pleasant as the 70s went on. I like fans on the pitch. I know it's not politically correct to say that, but if it's for the right reasons and everybody disperses quickly, th there's no greater explosion of joy, is there? And let's not forget, Ricky Jules, you got the other one. It's Ronnie Radford gets all the credit, but Ricky Jules got one. I, I remember you. George. And then the, the crowd were on the pitch again. And yeah. That was the greatest thing that we could have ever, ever have achieved. It's all over. They've done it. Well, what a cut time. What can you say? The mayor of Hereford 
uh, went into the Newcastle dressing room straight after the game, and he went, bad luck, lads, but you'll have to admit that the best team won. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, let's get let's deal with the rubbish which was the Tottenham FA Cup song. When it gets into Spurs territory, mate, that's where I bail. I didn't want to do it. Uh, I didn't like the song uh, at all. It's a terrible, terrible song. The song was Ozzy Goes to Wembley, so it was kind of my song. So it shouldn't be like that. But what about the other, the other ten and all the other players? And when people think that I, I, I didn't like it, until now. I, now, maybe because I'm older and so on, I, I do like it now. In fact, it's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful song. Yeah, I think Chaz and Dave, I think they're pretty underrated. They've done well for a couple of homeless lads. One thing to leave your home country, it's another thing to be bullied by Chaz and Dave on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure he knew what was going on, to be fair. Maybe for the whole of his stay at Tottenham. I think he was just doing his best and waiting for a visa to turn up. Ozzy's going to Wembley, his knees are going trembly. I mean, that is genius. No wonder Chaz and Dave went downhill from that point onwards. They would never reach those heights again. One of the great lines of all time. If Bob Dylan had written that. <laughs> Aussie, we're gonna be behind ya. All together, man for man. We know you're gonna play a blinder. In the cup for a dunding. Probably is the way I, I... No, probably not. That was the way I say it at the time. Uh, but teacher, I have a... But English teacher, I, I blame. At the cup for Tottingham. Wow. Ozzy didn't just go to Wembley, he went twice. And the following Thursday in the replay, it was fellow Argentinian Ricky Villa who stole the show. It was one of my first memories, really, of, of watching TV and thinking, well, that was special. Villa. And still Ricky Villa! What a fantastic run! He scored! Amazing goal! By Ricky Villa! Ricky Villa. Dodge six players ducking and diving and weaving with such cool and calm. Bang it in, they win, and it's all thanks to this Argentinian who is just cool as you like. He's jinking one way, he's taking it with his left foot, he's taking it with his right foot. There's two, there's three, there's four. It feels like he takes on everyone. It was on the biggest stage, you know, FA Cup final, and it was just different. It was a goal that you'd never seen before. There are certain goals that meant a lot, lot more. This one meant a lot because uh, we won the FA Cup because it was it was Ricky and because it was a beautiful goal. Ozzy Ardiles has fulfilled his great ambition. He has won an FA Cup winners' medal, and it's in the 100th final. Have you done the Garth Crooks leg? No. Oh, you've got to do this. Garth Crooks is sort of bottom left of the screen, and just when Ricky Villa kicks the ball, Garth Crooks does this. <clears throat> he does a fake right-footed kick, because he knows how important it is for Ricky Villa to score this goal against Manchester City. And Crooks' his little fake, go on, it's one of them, get in there! Get your wobbly leg out, Garth. What do you reckon it takes to win this? Well, you've got to be organised, you've got to be strong as a team, a game plan, great team spirit. And when you get in the final, you've really got to go for it and grab it by the kahunas. I, I get the team spirit thing, but is that really necessary? You've got to seize a chance. Take it and don't let it go. Crazy gang. Um, what can I say that hasn't been said? A naughty boys club. This small team from South London. And we fought off everybody. <laughs> the crazy gang never went out to ultimately intimidate people. We, we started off getting ourselves, you know, going and getting the adrenaline going and the buzz. Part of their image, their mantra, their, their joy was to be a little bit crazy. Crap in each other's shoes and set fire to their houses and, you know, kill their pets. Brilliant banter. They sort of looked mental. They were a good outfit, like, like Dave Bezan, Sanchez. Dennis Wise, like a little, you know, Jack Russell in the midfield, biting and kicking and then, oh, dear me. They were mouthy and they were totally unpleasant to play against. 
but you knew you were in a game and it was tough. And then Vinny just trying to plow through everybody. He's all right, Vinny Jones. I mean, like, uh, I said, if he did a very unique job as a footballer. Vinny's juggernaut, isn't it? Literally. He's physically imposing and he's got this steely gaze and he just has this presence, which I can imagine, you know, if you were some kind of, you know, quite skinny player, kind of, that he's, you know, he's got to mark, you would just look at him and think, he's going to crush me. He's probably on this programme, isn't he? Well, I'm just going to say he's really great. He's a, he's a very nice man and he's very articulate. I mean, it's a character, isn't it? It's a character. Right? What about the game today? Yeah, I'd... <laughs> There's plenty of that going on. Liverpool had gone out and they was in a tunnel already. And we were, you know, we'd made them wait a little bit. And Vinny and Fash had a, had a shout. And no one knows what it means. They used to shout, you the ho! You the ho! And I think at that moment, they realised we've got ourselves a game today. One of the, they're saying, a defining moment was the first challenge of, of Vinny and Steve McMahon. I'd watch Steve McMahon hundreds of times get the ball from the fullback, let it run across his body, turn out and play it out that way. So I was going to nail him. Here's McMahon. Oof, Vinny Jones caught him there. Now that's precisely the sort of challenge that uh, Wimbledon had been, shall we say, reputed to produce. It was a proper tackle. He got the ball, got the man, put him up in the air. I just remember seeing his legs way above his head. That was a statement, you know, Vinny was our man, Macca was their man, and, and we won that battle. He didn't know where he was, and they were, and they were sponging him down. He was looking at his eyes. And Sanchez was in there, and that's a goal for Wimbledon! Laurie Sanchez! We all stood and went, eh? Um, what's just happened? Of course, Fash and Sanchez didn't get on. They, they hated each other. So Fash weren't too, too happy about going and jumping all over Sanchez and congratulating him. So it's quite weird, the celebration, if you look at it. There is Aldridge, Beardsley. Well, he might score here. Hamilton. Good year on Aldridge. Wimbledon protest. And the decision, good year thinks he played the ball. I'd seen John Aldridge take probably three penalties. He'd come up, he'd done a little stutter, and in that little stutter, the keeper tended to, to move one way or the other. And I said, if I can stand still through that stutter, and he sees me standing still, he tends to go to my left. Less than thought the kick might go to his left, or the right as we look, if Aldridge decides to go the same way as in the semi-final. He did, and he saved it, and made history. The first time ever that a penalty kick has not been converted in the FA Cup final here. And Besson did guess right, his homework paid off. We'd watched so many videos, if Dave Besson hadn't have gone the right way, I'd have killed him. Oh, and there it is! The crazy gang have beaten the culture club. Well, boy, George was big at that time, wasn't he? Come a chameleon and all that. Apparently, they had the nickname The Crazy Gang, which they'd given themselves for years, and it wasn't until Motson said it that on the telly that everyone started using it, which is good, because there's nothing worse than a nickname you've given yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Wimbledon have destroyed Liverpool's dreams of the double, and all over the pitch, their players are celebrating something which a few years ago would have been impossible. Her Royal Highness applauds one of the great cut shocks of all time. People that knew about the game and about football knew that, you know, we weren't just a, a pub team. It's a weird and wonderful world if you come from Wimbledon. They've won the FA Cup. Come on, why is he behind me? Aye, aye, you <laughs> And I'm thinking again, I think, Princess Diana's here, you know, you're, you're just abusing in front of Princess Diana. Everybody played their part, and without each character within that team, we wouldn't achieve what we did. Got up on the Monday morning, severe hangover, and it was like it was all over. The biggest thing in your life, Monday morning, everything was back to normal. It was one of the great FA Cup finals for drama.
everything that a final should have. Going into the final, we were very confident. Looking back on the game now, maybe a little bit too overconfident, and we certainly got a, a big shock in the opening 20 minutes. I didn't expect you know, to get the start we got, so it was a, a major shock. There was a sort of a sense that, oh yes, yes, this is it, this is real, this is real. But by the time we were two goals up, that's when I thought, this can't last, this, is, this can't be real. Unbelievable feeling, feeling that. And being a West Ham fan, you just know, don't let them get a goal. Oh, and Cissé was coming in there. Oh, and he's got it! Gabriel Cissé gets a goal back for Liverpool, and what a cup final we've got here now! Once they scored one, then you just thought, this could be it. This is Alonso. Two players far post. Here comes Gerrard! It's 2-2! Two -two. It's Steven Gerrard for Liverpool! Sometimes them knockdowns are not always perfect, but this one felt like a dream and I got nice contact on it. And I knew as soon as it left me, thought it was, it was going to be in. Liverpool get back in it and you think they're going to go on to win it and then Konczewski scores. I mean, it looks fantastic, but it's got to be a cross. Surely has to be. Konczewski obviously knows that he's crossed it, but celebrates like it's, it's a goal and it's intentional. And then Alan Pardew, the West Ham manager, if you watch him, he has the fastest drink in history. I don't know why. Maybe he's nervous and he's realised that we could potentially win the FA Cup final, but he literally goes like this, <laughs> just downs it as fast as he can. All of a sudden now, it's like a cruel trick on West Ham fans. Because you're, you're going, well, OK, we haven't thrown it away. We've gone back in front now. Players were going down a cramp and everything. And the fourth official has just indicated four minutes, because the 90 minutes is up. And as he says four minutes, it comes out to Gerard. Every part of my body was aching. So when it fell to me, I, it, was, it was a lucky one. It was a, you know, hit it as hard as you can. Gerard! He's got it! Oh, Steven Gerard! Just when he's on pitch, he's on out of it, and he collides for Liverpool. With 90 minutes gone, it's 3 3. The reason I hit my shot to get the second equaliser was just through sheer tiredness. If I was feeling fresh, I'd have certainly controlled that and tried to build up an attack and play it out wide. I caught it, probably the sweetest connection I've had in my career. And he just wallops this shot in, for it must be 30, 35 yards out. He just connected with it, the way that even professional footballers dream about hitting a shot like that. It was a great strike. Shaka Hislop got down to his right, but he couldn't get near it. To see that one at the back of the net was a bit of a shock because of how far out I was, but I'll take it. And that's it then. Extra time on that. We're not going to win this. After the way the game had gone and how Liverpool had pulled it back from the brink, you always felt that in the penalty shootout that they were going to come out on top. Anton Ferdinand has got a score. If he doesn't score from this, Liverpool have won the cup. I can't even remember the penalties and things. I'm not even sure like what happened. It was just like a sort of a wasteland. Steven Gerrard was phenomenal that day, and he's got to be up there with the greatest Liverpool players that have ever, you know, pulled on that red shirt. That is a perfect example of just how important Gerrard is to to Liverpool. And genuinely, at times, um, you know, it, it can be a one-man show, and and he's very, very capable, and he shows that. He's done that time and time again, and you've just got to hold your hands up and just say, you know, that it's a quality player, and that's what big players do, they produce at the right time. I certainly peaked on that day and one of my favourite performances that I've ever had. So that is it, the big countdown is over, we've reached number one. Yep, what an achievement, the greatest ever FA Cup moment. Now you have scored plenty of goals in your time and you've had some great celebrations and rightly so. Well, we won't go bananas after scoring a goal in an FA Cup game. Exactly. Ryan Giggs, over to you. Number one. Oh, is it the number one moment? Oh, yeah. If you say Ryan Giggs, to me, this is the goal that you remember him for. Yeah, obviously at the time it was the, the, the two top teams in the in the Premier League and fighting it out for everything really. And the whole build-up was whoever wins this game, whoever goes into the FA Cup final, 
will also win the Premier League. So this had much more significance than just getting through to the FA Cup final. Two of the best teams in England came together and produced an absolute masterclass in football. There was nothing in the game. We, we probably shaded the first half, they shaded the second half, Roy got sent off, and then it was back to the wall stuff. Carla. Lokats made a run towards him. Oh, upended! Surely by Philip Neville, it's a penalty! Two minutes of stoppage time have already been played at the end of the regulation 90. No question about the contact. And this, effectively, is for a place in the cup final. It's Bergkamp, and it's saved by Peter Schmeichel! With penalties, it's just, honestly, luck of the draw. He put it exactly where I've already decided it was going to go. He was the best keeper I've played with, but he wasn't great at saving penalties. Not that I can remember, he didn't save too many, so he saved it for, for obviously a special night. Peter makes a great save. Next thing I know, Patrick gives the ball away. No! Why couldn't that fall like, to of any the, other player on the pitch? One of the moments, and it gets, yeah. gets it, everyone's on their feet. The error. It's a careless pass. It's been picked up by Ryan Giggs. York has made a diagonal run, the support in the centre as well. But this is still Ryan Giggs who's past Keown, past Dixon, and has scored a sensational goal! What a moment for Ryan Giggs! And for Manchester United, it is one of the truly great FA Cup goals. I couldn't really recollect how far I'd got the ball out and how many players that I'd beat. It was, like I say, it was just purely instinctive. We're looking at it and we're like, take him out! Take him up! No science about it, it was just whacking the ball as hard as I could. It was a game that needed an individual to stand out and do something which was out of the ordinary. I can't remember I've seen anything like that at that time in a game of that importance. Like, why have you not just taken him out, just gone clean through him? It's the greatest thing I've ever seen on a football pitch. I'm not talking about the goal, I'm talking about Giggs' chest. The physique was there for all to see. I mean, a lot of the girls would have been whooping, I should think, when he pulled his shirt up. I was just like, whoa, <laughs> hello. <laughs> a magnificently built man. I remember with the shirt going around, around. I was there in my living room. I was doing this. I had my shirt off. It's very rare that you see gigs get overexcited and get carried away, and I think you could see what that goal meant to him. Like, I honestly don't know what I was doing, so it was just one of those moments where you just had an out-of-body experience and you just lost. Many players will tell you if you scored an important goal, you just you just don't know what you're doing. That's good. That's good. That's good. Giggs is incredible. Oh my God, Giggs is hairy. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the levels of excitement yeah. just keep coming. What? <laughs> you know, if I was as hirsute uh, as Mr. Giggs, then I might well take my shirt off. Very impressive. Uh, very impressive sort of thatch. Dense Amazonian pubic forest. I was only a kid and I didn't have any chest on me, like hair on my chest, and I was just. And my dad always had a big hairy chest, and that's the moment. Because I used to look at my dad and think that looks weird, that does. But then when Giggsy did it, I was like, ah, I can see it now. I don't think many people thought that men had hair like that on their chest anymore. I can't even say it thinking about it. I don't think he has it anymore, does he? I think it's gone now. I think it was. Uh, last time I saw him. <laughs> I don't know if I'm seeing him with his shirt off. I'm surprised that Phil never looks at other men like that. And then I'm thinking, no, I'm not surprised at all. Chess rug is no more, no. It's all gone silver and grey anyway, so, yeah. Giggs changed the way women look at men that day, I reckon, when he scored that goal. It's the best goal I've ever scored, just purely because it was what I was all about as a player, really. Um, taking players on, unbalancing players. I think it, it, it was a trend, trademark for, for his career, that goal. No doubt this thoroughly deserves to be the number one FA Cup moment. They're the goals that you remember, really, the, the, the ones that you score in the big game that matter. Well, that was quite the journey, wasn't it? Yep, stunning goals. Constant drama. Fairy tale comebacks. Fashion disasters. Giggsy's hairy chest. Some serious giant killing. Yeah, it had everything, didn't it? We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. I don't want to ruin the moment, but I did promise to give this back, so... No, this is the first time I've had my hands on this trophy, so it's not going back anytime soon. So, goodbye, all. Goodbye, thanks for watching. That's quite a grip. This could get awkward. <laughs>